Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to begin with our feature, Chris Kraft, who died recently at the age of 95. Chris Kraft was the creator and head of NASA's mission control during the space flights of the 1960s. And ironically, he died two days after the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. Here is Houston Television KPRC2 reporting on the death of Chris Kraft. We begin tonight with breaking news on the passing of NASA and space legend Chris Kraft. During this 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon mission, the space agency announcing the death of a legendary NASA flight director. Our Phil Archer live in the newsroom now with the legacy Kraft leave behind. Phil? Well, Bill, the nation in Houston lost a true pioneer today, Chris Kraft, was a legend at NASA. He was one of the original scientists picked to man that agency when it was first formed in 1958. He became NASA's sole flight director for the first manned missions of the Mercury program. In the process, he developed NASA doctrine for managing space flights in those early days. The Mission Control Building at JSC is now named for him. He went on to help plan the Apollo missions to the moon, and then from there to become director of the Johnson Space Center in the early 70s. He served at that post until his retirement in 1982. He was smart, plain-spoken, and feisty, and that was on display when I interviewed him in December 2016. I was privileged to be in that position, very privileged. I mean, who the hell was going to be flight director on the first space flight of first seven, to actually more than that, 15 or so? He told me that he felt his prime responsibility at NASA was to get the astronauts back alive, and he lived up to that responsibility. Well, Chris Kraft was pretty much a household name during the 1960s space flights, and here's the New York Post on his career. Behind America's late leap into orbit and triumphant small step on the moon was the agile mind and guts of steel of Chris Kraft, making split-second decisions that propel the nation to once unimaginable heights. Christopher Columbus Kraft Jr. never flew in space, but held the success or failure of American human spaceflight in his hands. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, told the AP in 2011. Kraft founded Mission Control and created the job of flight director, later comparing it to an orchestra conductor, and established how flights would be run as the space race between the United States and Soviets heated up. The legendary engineer served as flight director for all of the one-man Mercury flights and seven of the two-man Gemini flights, helped design the Apollo missions that took 12 Americans to the moon from 1969 to 1972, and later served as director of the Johnson Space Center until 1982, overseeing the beginning of the era of the space shuttle. Armstrong once called him the man who was the control in mission control. From the moment the mission starts until the moment the crew is safe on board a recovery ship, I'm in charge, Kraft wrote in his 2002 book, Flight, My Life in Mission Control. No one can overrule me. They can fire me after it's over, but while the mission is underway, I'm flight, and flight is God. Kraft became known as the father of mission control, and in 2011, NASA returned the favor by naming the Houston building that houses the Nerf Center after Kraft. It's where the heart of the mission is, Kraft said in an April 2010 AP interview. It's where decisions are made every day, small and large. We realized that the people that had the moxie, that had the knowledge, were there and could make the decisions. That's what Chris Kraft's mission control was about. Smart people with knowledge discussing options quickly and the flight director making a quick, informed decision said former Smithsonian Institution space historian Roger Launius. It's the place that held its collective breath as Neil Armstrong was guiding the Eagle lunar lander on the moon while fuel was running out. And it's the place that improvised the last-minute rescue of Apollo 13, a dramatic scenario that later made the unsung engineers heroes in a popular movie. Soon it became more than NASA's mission control. Hurricane forecasting centers, city crisis centers, even the Russian Space Center are all modeled after the mission control the craft created, Lowney has said. Leading up to the first launch to put an American, John Glenn, in orbit, a reporter asked Kraft about the odds of success, and he replied, If I thought about the odds at all, we'd never go to the pad. It was a wonderful life. I can't think of anything that an aeronautical engineer would get more out of than what we were asked to do in the space program in the 60s, Kraft said on NASA's website, marking the 50th anniversary of the agency in 2008. In the early days of Mercury at Flores, Cape Canaveral, before Mission Control moved to Houston in 1965, there were no computer displays. 
All you had was grease pencils, Kraft recalled. The average age of the flight control team was 26, Kraft was 38. We didn't know a damn thing about putting a man into space, Kraft wrote in his autobiography. We had no idea how much it should or would cost. And at best, we were engineers trained to do, not business expert trained to manage. NASA trailed the Soviet space program and suffered through many failed launches in the early days before the manned flights began in 1961. Kraft later recalled thinking President John F. Kennedy had lost his mind when in May 1961 he set as a goal a manned trip to the moon before this decade is out. We had a total of 15 minutes of manned space flight experience. We hadn't flown Mercury in orbit yet, and here's a guy telling me we're going to fly to the moon. Doing it was one thing, but doing it in this decade was to me too risky, Graf told AP in 1989. Frankly, it scared the hell out of me, he said at a 2009 lecture at the Smithsonian. After the two-man Gemini flights, Graf moved up NASA management to be in charge of manned spaceflight and was stunned by the Apollo 1 training fire that killed three astronauts. Chris Kraft had pioneered mission control and fought the battles in Mercury and Gemini, serving as the role model of the flight director. He proved the need for real-time leadership. Apollo 11 flight director Eugene Kranz wrote in his book, Failure is Not an Option, Mission Control from Mercury to Apollo 13 and Beyond. After his retirement, Kraft served as an aerospace consultant and was chairman of a panel in the mid-1990s looking for a cheaper way to manage the shuttle program. The people of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo are blossoms on the moon. Their spirits will live there forever, he wrote. I was part of that crowd, then part of the leadership that opened space travel to human beings. We threw a narrow flash of light across our nation's history. I was there at the best of times. Well, we're going to move on now to Rutger Hauer, who died recently at the age of 75. Blonde hair, blue eyes, he was Dutch. And he could play a good badass. He had just the look for it. He did most of his work in the Netherlands and in Europe until the 1980s. In the 1980s, he starred as the bad guy opposite Sylvester Stallone in Nighthawks, which was an above-average Sylvester Stallone movie, but Rutger Hauer was really menacing in it. He was the lead in the movie called The Hitcher, where he played an ominous hitchhiker, and he could project a definite air of danger. But he's best known for playing the replicant Roy Batty opposite Harrison Ford in the Ridley Scott futuristic thriller Blade Runner. That's his signature role. Here he is with my man Harrison Ford in the climactic scene of the movie. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of game. All those moments will be lost in time like tears in rain. Time to die. Well, that's the most famous speech in the movie, and Rutger Hauer wrote it himself. Here's Ridley Scott to talk about it. He's a superman, nice man. And he came up with that little speech? Yes, he wrote it. At 1 o'clock in the morning, I was going to be fired at 3. <laughs> <laughs> and then so he said, Rutger wants it. Oh, so I went, boom, 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 through the rain to his trailer. He's sitting there saying, I haven't written a speech. I went, no. And he said, no, 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 sit down and listen. And he said, okay, ready, go. And he read it, and it was... Great. I said, well, you stole that. He said, no, no, I just wrote it. That's amazing. I said, that's what we're going to do. Damn. The only one really, there was Hunter's line saying, time to die, which is kind of nice. But the lead up to it, I've seen things you've seen. Yeah, I've seen that? starships in the belt of our life. Belt of yeah. So rather than doing all that firework digitally, you say it, so it's like a shelly point. Yeah, as I said, that was the highlight, but he had a pretty good long career. Played a bunch of Nazis. He played Albert Speer in a movie. They had to darken his hair. He's always good for Nazis, but he'd occasionally play a good guy, and he had a nice sympathetic tone about him when he did. Well, we're going to close tonight with David Hedison, who died recently at the age of 92. This guy was one of my favorite actors. I love David Hedison. He's primarily known for two roles. The first is the 1950s horror film The Fly, the original. He plays a scientist who gets mixed up with a fly in some sort of molecular transporter. He's Vincent Price's brother. For the most of the movie, he has to wear a hood over his head because he doesn't want anybody to see that he looks like a fly. But the last scene where he has the fly's body in his head, 
and he's caught in a spider web. As the spider comes to eat him, is one of the classics in all of horror. You can just hear his soft little voice as Vincent Price and Herbert Marshall watch the spider devour him. Please, please. All right, show me where. Here's the Wait in the house. It's a good boy. and Vincent Price hit the spider with a rock after he eats David Hedison. Actually, it was Al Hedison in that movie. And he was in another classic horror movie, The Lost World, which was put together by Irwin Allen. But then Al Hedison changed his name to David Hedison. And Irwin Allen got into television in 1964 with a new series, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And that's where David Hedison made his name. Here's a little documentary on it, narrated by June Lockhart, who was in one of the early episodes and that's what got her on Irwin Allen's next venture, Lost in Space. In 1964, Irwin Allen took the big plunge into television with a weekly version of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. This is the Sea View, the most extraordinary submarine in all the seven seas. Welcome aboard the Sea View, gentlemen. I'm Irwin Allen, the producer and sometimes writer-director of this new series. Using set costumes and stock footage from his feature film. He dazzled audiences with one of the most spectacular pilots ever produced. For TV's Admiral Nelson, Irwin cast veteran actor Richard Basehart. I was too close for comfort. Co-starring as Captain Lee Crane was one of the survivors of The Lost World, David Hedison. Dive! All dive! 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 All dive! Irwin called, and he wanted me to do a film called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And after my experience on The Lost World, I just couldn't, I couldn't face it, because it was basically the same thing. So I, I turned it down. And then uh, a couple of years after that, he called me for Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the series. I turned that down, and the guy wouldn't let go. So finally, after I heard that Richard Basehart was playing the Admiral. I was terribly impressed that he got Richard. And I thought, well, God, if Richard Basehart can do this, I certainly can. No, sir, the orders are quite clear. To complete the mission, I'm to regard Seaview and her entire crew as expendable. <laughs> if you have a choice, though, Captain, I assume you'll bring us all back alive. I think Irwin, what he was trying to accomplish was to make a very exciting, fast-paced one hour. You know, with no baloney in between. He was great to me. I liked him, but we were always arguing. I would say, Erwin, we, you know, here, Captain Crane, Admiral Nelson, there should be some sort of humor in the characters. Not so grim, but he would have none of it. He just knew that he always wanted the action to be very grim and very solid and very tense. And that's what he got. All hands, this is the captain. The attack's been canceled. And I forgot my line. The best thing we're going to do is lose those destroyers. Cut, Brent. I like... Cut it. I'm so glad that I finally was able to do Voyage, especially because of Richard, who was so intelligent and what a wonderful actor. Such a nice guy to have as a friend. Stand by. <laughs> Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. David Hedison was great as Captain Crane on the Sea View in the first season. It was a very good show. And it devolved in the last three seasons into monsters and all sorts of crazy stuff. Occasionally they have one good show, but it was pretty ridiculous. And I think they all knew it too. But he still kept it together. So as a final tribute to David Hedison, we're going to play the theme from The Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea by Paul Sautel, orchestrated by Nelson Riddle.